right, good morning. Glad to have everyone here. It's a beautiful day outside and good place to be on a Sunday morning here in church. So let's all stand up and we're going to sing Brethren We Have Met to Worship. is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. And the trust that you have been praying for this service this morning, been praying for me, been praying for those in children's church, working in the nursery, the greeters, security, this nothing can function properly without him. Without me, you can do what? Do I really believe that? Do I really believe that? So that's something we need to constantly keep in mind as believers. We have to depend on you for every single thing, even breath in your body, even breath in your body. Glad you're here this morning. Let's look at our verse of the week, if you would, and join with me, Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll begin. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. I trust it will be a blessing to you. It's, it's a, been a blessing to me every time I, I read through Ephesians. It's one of the special books to me in the New Testament. And uh, trust it will be a, just an encouragement to every believer here today. Well, we want to um, encourage our men to come forward at this time for prayer. And as you're coming, we want to remember the Woody family. This is uh, Barbara's sister's family, and think they all have COVID, and her sister's pretty sick. They're going to be tested here uh, later today. Uh, where, where does your sister live, Barbara? In Alabama. So if you would pray for that family. And let's just ask God to do a really special work here in the service this morning. So if you will, join me in prayer, please. Father, I thank you for everyone who is here today. And I'm certain with this time of year, as we approach summer, that there are people who are out of town today. So wherever they may be, one thought I'd ask you to just keep in their mind that on the Lord's Day they would honor you and be in your house, wherever they may be. Lord, I thank you that our folks have honored you by being in your house this morning. And we just want to thank you for providing us this place, a place to come and gather together to encourage one another sometimes to provoke one another to love and to good works. So just ask that this time of service and then after the service when people uh, just linger and talk that it would be encouraging and helpful to one another. Uh, there are people here with burdens, burdens I don't know anything about. But Lord, you know every heart here, you know every heavy heart here, you know every need here. And you're the God who said, I'll supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we accept that and ask that you would meet every need and just deliver from every burden. Thank you that we can take our burdens and just give them to you and trust you to relieve and help us through those times. 
pray for the Woody family. Uh, you would just minister to them. We know the code is pretty common. Uh, many people get it. Nevertheless, since it's still a, a relatively new disease, it's always unnerving when we hear that people have it. So just minister to them in a special way because you're the great physician. I ask you to do a special work in that, that entire family. Lord, we just want to ask that you would have your way here this morning and later this afternoon in our services, whether it's the children's church, Lord, whether it's the ministry in the nursery, right here in this auditorium, the Bible study hour later on. Be pleased with what is taught, what is preached, and the way that people are ministered to. And Lord, help us to be constantly aware of your presence that's here. The Lord will thank you for it. We thank you for these men who come to this altar to pray. I ask you to hear the prayers of your people. The Lord, be pleased to answer today. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as you return to your seats, we're going to sing, Be Exalted, O God. We're going to sing that one time through. sing one more before announcements. We're going to sing God is so good. We're just going to do, uh, we're going to do all the verses of this. Good morning. If you are happy to be here, let's get that hand up. Happy the person beside you, in front of you, or behind you is here. We got the other hand up. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people said, praise the Lord. Now, at 5 o'clock this evening, we do have our Bible study hour. So keep that in mind. Adults and teens will meet up here, then go to our various groups. The children will meet downstairs. Now, after that, we do have a deacons and trustees meeting, so deacons and trustees, please be prepared for that. And Wednesday, we have our Bible study for the adults 
in our teen group over at the Family Life Center. There is no Awanas. But if you have your bulletin, last week they had the dinner and the Awana, the Awana Awards Banquet. And just there's some special recognition in there. Uh, the Workman Trophy, this is for the girl that completed three books in a year. And that's Katie Fox. So congratulations on that. Raise your hand, Katie. So that, that's Katie right there. Most people haven't read three books in a lifetime. So that just puts it in perspective. The Christian Character Trophy went to Corbin Gillespie. Where's Corbin at? Oh, he's not here. Okay. Well, neither's the next people. The Merit Awards went to Aubrey Lambert and Navaya Wilfong. So that's good to be an encouragement. But, you know, that's a reflection of their parents, you know, and, and having that support. So but praise God for that program. Uh, June the 3rd, that's on a Friday, we have the Ignite the Youth Rally. That's in Ripley, West Virginia, believe it or not. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you, have to be, you have to be 50 or older to appreciate that going to be departing the church at four o'clock so you know teenagers be prepared for that parents encourage your teenagers to go that's going to be a great time now june the 12th we will be honoring our high school and college graduates and right after that they're going to have a grace family dinner so that's going to be an exciting time now the faith faith promise missions commitment forms are located in the upstairs and downstairs foyer please fill those out pray about it, and then put them in the, the little offering box in the back of the church. I need those. Hopefully get those in by June the 12th. So that way we'll be able to know what kind of, of money we have and who we can support. So that's, that's always a good thing. Next Sunday there's going to be a VBS meeting for those workers or those that would like to, to join in the, in the program for VBS. Uh, VBS is June the 20th through the 24th. Uh, but we're going to have a short meeting right after the morning worship service next Sunday. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you don't know where you're going to plug in, plug yourself in the other category, and we'll put you where we need you. Thank you for that. Uh, also, this is the last thing I have. This is the top ten things that people should not think about. Or no, they're the top eight. My wife told me to keep it short. The top eight things that people shouldn't think about while singing a hymn. Number eight, whoa, the person behind me actually hit the right note. <laughs> Number seven, only 90 minutes left till the game starts. Number six, gas prices will rise before we finish this song. <laughs> Number five, what's the likelihood of the ceiling fan falling and hitting me on the head? Number four, I nailed the first verse. I'm surprised I don't have a recording contract. Number three, what would the hymn sound like if we added bagpipes and maybe a little cowbell? Number two, how many more verses are we going to sing? That probably hit home with a lot of people. And then the number one thing you should not think about while singing a hymn is, man, our pastor sings as good as he looks. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to have you guys stand one more time. We're going to sing one of my favorite songs, Be Thou My Vision. And uh, just encourage you to really think about what you're saying and just offer as a prayer to the Lord. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save as Thou.
sing. You may be seated. Set the rambus free. 
for me. Well, that's a really tremendous message in that song. It's a really pretty song. I never heard that before. Thank you for that. Uh, you've heard me say, and I think you've heard other men say, if you had been the only one to live on the face of the earth and you personally would have nailed Christ to that cross and you would have spit in his face, he still would have died for you. He would have done it just for you. That's how much he loves you. I'm going to have you take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, and while you're turning there, right after the morning service, right here in the front, I'm going to meet with the parents who have teenagers going to the Wilds camp this summer. And so right after the service, take maybe 10 minutes at the at tops, and uh, we'll go over some information concerning teen camp. There's a couples conference. It's a one-night-only conference, and it's on Saturday, June 4th. There's no cost. They have refreshments and, and all that would be included. This it starts at 6 and it concludes at 8.15, and it is Scott and Tammy Pauley. Now, last year for the revival preparation meeting where all the churches gathered together on that first Sunday night in December, we heard Evangelist Pauley speak. I've heard of him, never heard him before, but everybody that spoke to me said, wow, what a, what a tremendous preacher this man was. And he is going to be speaking, his wife it is for obviously married couples, and if you're interested in going, just personally let me know. It's just a one-night thing that Saturday evening from 6 to 8.15, again, no cost to it, but if you would let me know, and then I'll contact them. Let me know by next Sunday, and I'll contact them, let them know if, uh, how many folks that might be interested in coming to that. And then I want to say thank you to the Iwana workers uh, for a tremendous year. Uh, with all that's gone on since 2020, nothing has been normal, but it kind of felt like a normal year to, to at least to some degree. And I appreciate the work that you put in to making this year, uh, I guess we'd just say a success. A few weeks ago, there was five uh, young people that put their trust in Christ. I think through the year, maybe up to seven children put their faith in Christ and were grateful for all the work that you did, uh, including the van drivers. Uh, some of these guys don't get back here till 10 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and they don't complain about it. They just go out and they just do it, and I appreciate the men and women who drive our church vans. Now, Awana is done, as Paul mentioned. Every summer we have a, a club called Kids Club, and uh, we take a little bit of a break, and then we begin this. It will begin later on in the month of June, There'll be a kids club workers meeting on Wednesday night, June 8th, and then there'll be the kickoff for the kids club on June 15th. And then the following week, we'll have the vacation Bible school. So just keep those things in mind. But again, just wanted to say thank you to those folks who've been working diligently this past school year to uh, just uh, minister to folks. Appreciate that very much. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get right into the word of God this morning. Father, I thank you for loving me. I thank you, thank you that it was for me you died. For me you came. For me you shed your blood. But every believer in this auditorium can say the very same thing, and hopefully right now from their heart are saying that to you. Thank you that you came for me. That really leads right into what we're looking at this morning and Lord, my purpose is just one purpose, to be an encouragement to your people this morning. We, sometimes we just need to be encouraged. And I ask that this would be an encouragement to them, a blessing to them, as we look into your word today. And Lord, uh, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Use me. Keep my mind clear. Keep my mind focused on what you have given me the task to do, to preach your word. Well, thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, right before we get into this book, in the weeks to come, I'm going to address just some practical issues that we are facing as Christians. Uh, some are just extremely practical. Some are doctrinal uh, concerns that we now find entering into our independent fundamental 
churches, people with doctrines that are uh, damaging. So I'm going to address some of those things in the coming weeks and address some of the cultural things that are going on in our country. And so I thought, you know what, I don't want to start on that this Sunday. I've not preached for the last month because we, we've had missionaries here. And I thought, you know, this first Sunday I just want to be an encouragement. And this is what the Lord's led me to, so I hope, again, it will be a blessing to you. Uh, I want you to look with me this morning here in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1. And then I'm going to jump to verse 15. So I want you to keep your minds engaged today. This is going to sound a little bit like a, like a lecture to a degree for the first few minutes. But I just want to keep your minds engaged in what we're doing here this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. I just want you to notice Paul is speaking to the saints, to the faithful, and they are in Christ Jesus. I don't think we can ever make this too big of a deal. You see me using my hands up here, maybe I should have a telestrator put images up on the screen, but Christ, you, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. Now the book of Colossians tells us that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Either way, you can't lose with that. But the stress mainly is the fact that when you were saved, you were put in Christ. Now jump ahead to verse 15. Wherefore, here's a conjunction, a word that is saying, everything I've just written to you, church, everything I've just written, I'm about to express in the purposes of how I'm praying for you. Wherefore, because of the things I've written, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, that's why they're saints, that's why they're faithful, because they were saved people. They had put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they demonstrated it. Paul said, and the love unto all the saints. That's something that is expressed. That's something that is seen when you love other people. Now notice as he goes on. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Paul says, I'm, I'm writing to you, saints and faithful. I have heard of your faith in Christ and how it's demonstrated by the way you love the saints. And that drives me to pray. And he said, when I pray for you, he said, I thank God for you. I thank God that you are in him. I thank God that you are saints. I thank God that you're faithful. I thank him for the love that you express to others. I'm thankful that you're saved. Isn't it good to be saved? Isn't it good to know that you are no longer condemned? Isn't it good to know that you have a home, a mansion? And I believe when the Bible says mansion, it does not mean rooms. It means mansions. That's not too hard for God. It took six years, six literal days to create the universe. He's been taking 2,000 years to prepare heaven for his children, for his bride. I think he'll give me more than just a little room in the corner. Here he is, he says, I thank God for you. 
making mention of you in my prayers. Now, you hear the word mention, and it's in, in my first thought of this word, it's like, well, that, it just means he's just kind of passing by this very quickly. But when you read what he's praying, it's like that's, that's not just some glick, you know, glib thought where you, you bless the Ephesians, Father. And I know it's much more than that. I have, over my 18 years as your pastor, sought to daily pray for you in the ways that the Apostle Paul prayed for his people without fail. These are the ways that I pray for you. And he says here in verse 17, he said, I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want, I want God to reveal what you have in Jesus Christ. Now notice this, in the knowledge of him. God wants you and me to know Jesus Christ, to know him in a depth. And he said, I'm praying, I am asking God to just open your hearts and minds, give you the spirit of wisdom, a wisdom about who Jesus Christ is, a, a revealing in the knowledge of him. Now, listen, I, I made a comment, uh, uh, maybe it was Wednesday night, uh, the last few weeks, about uh, Karl Marx. Karl Marx, who is the father of socialism, i.e. communism. The communist socialistic system has led billions of people to eternal damnation because they reject any thought of God. The state is God. That is the direction of the United States right now. The state, the government, is our God. and We must become totally dependent on them for everything. May you reject that, that false belief. But many of the Americans in our generation are receiving that and accepting that now. Anyway, I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail here. Karl Marx, as a boy in Europe, attended church. And as a boy, on one given Sunday morning in front of his congregation, stood and quoted, word perfect, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Karl Marx stood in front of his family's church, that congregation that where they attended, and word perfect quoted the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Karl Marx is in hell this morning. You say, well, who are you to judge? Well, I, I don't have to judge anyone who rejects God. They've already stated, I am a God rejecter, a God denier. You can't be saved. You can't be a saint. You can't be faithful if you reject even the thought of God. Karl Marx, and listen to me, had a bunch of knowledge about God growing up in a church. One of the fears that I have for the children that we bring from the outside into our ministry, whether it's at the Bible study hour or at a one or a kids club or whoever it may be, how many come and heap up knowledge? I even fear this for, and I did for years, even for my own children, that they would not just have knowledge, but they would know him. It doesn't do me or you any good to have a bunch of knowledge about Jesus. We need to know him. Look at that verse again that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and, and what? Revelation, a revealing in the knowledge of him. Not just to have a bunch of facts, but so you can know who he really is, how good he is, how powerful he is. Paul said, this is why I'm praying for you. Verse 18 that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, again, not knowledge, but to know what is the hope of his calling. In verse 18, Paul writes and he says, I'm praying that your understanding will be enlightened, that the light bulb will go on. I remember 
the first time I really took interest in preaching. I mean, where I didn't just sit in a service and my mind wander over here or wander over there, or I think it was, I was about 11 or 12 years of age, and I would have my pen, and you know, I had my Bible open, pastor would say, turn in your Bibles. I had it open, but I had a piece of paper, I'd start doodling. Now, before, there are some folks who doodle in here, sometimes that's the way people learn. They have to be doing things. When we had Good News Club, I would get upset when I was teaching, I'd see kids goofing, or what appeared to be goofing around, and the experts say, whoa, 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 before you jump all over the case, realize that sometimes people sit there and doodle or they fidget with their hands, their mind is engaged, they just do other things. But that's not what I was doing at that stage of my life. I was doodling because I wasn't concentrating. I remember it was a Sunday night service. I could take you to the very spot I sat in that huge auditorium. I remember when Dr. Henniger said something that caught my attention. I remember this. And from that moment, Whatever it was he said all those years ago that caught my attention, from that moment, literally, I fell in love with preaching. I don't care if it's someone who is scholarly and speaks in a monotone voice. I don't care, and listen, I've been, I've been in services where men walk on the pews and you say, that's, that's sacrilegious. No, it's not. I'm not their judge and you're not their judge. Where they shout and they scream and they run around the auditorium, waving hankies. Praise the Lord for that. Maybe we need a little bit more of that at Grace Baptist. Whatever it may be, I just, I just love preaching. Any style of preaching. I just love it. And from that moment, my focus has been on God's man in, in the pulpit, wherever it may be. And the reason I say all that is because it's through the preaching of God's word, through the as Paul describes the foolishness of preaching, that there have been times where, boom, the light's gone on. Where somebody has said something that's like, that makes all the sense in the world. And now I understand this about my Savior. I really didn't understand that before, but now I do. Oh, we need the preaching of God's word. We need to avail ourselves every time to be underneath whoever the man may be. Hear the preaching of God's word. Why? So that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. Why? So that we can know what is the hope of his calling. What's that calling? Your salvation. You have been called to salvation. And I love this. Paul said the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God will never change his mind on the day that he saved you. He will never, ever change his mind. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise what? He said it will never happen. My calling to you of salvation is without repentance. You say, even when I blow it? Yeah. Harold and I were witnessing to a lady yesterday, and after we went through the gospel with her, she said, you know, and she named the date, she said, back in the year 2017, I think it was the month of June, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, Harold, but I think she said the month of June, she said, I, I accepted Christ as my Savior. But when we began to talk to her, she, was, she said, well, I, I hope I'm going to heaven. So that kind of opened the door just to go through the, she was very gracious, let me go through all the plan of salvation with her. But, but this, this lady didn't have that, that hope. What is the word hope? The, the expectation of her calling. And sometimes when we don't become enlightened to the knowledge and really know Jesus Christ, we can't perceive that God would continue to love us and keep us as part of his, of his family when we fail him. Can I ask a question? How many over the course of this year, these five months, have found yourself at times, doing what is wrong. Okay, all right. Now, I'm surprised that there are people who haven't raised their hand. I'm going to tell you something. I struggle at times with sin. I get angry. Sometimes I doubt. There are times God says, do this. And God says, whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is. Did God tell you to come out and 
help us witness yesterday? I think we had five people. I know that's not the only place you can witness. I know people here witness at work and you witness in the neighborhood. But I bet there's at least one or two more people that you said, I just don't feel like going today. It's going to be 90 degrees outside. I'm just not going to go. God pricked you about it, but you just said no. That's sin. I mean, let's just be honest. It's sin. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of sins. It doesn't mean you have to go out and murder someone or rape somebody or, or embezzle you know, someone. You, it just we sin. Someone talks to you and you don't, you've had a bad day, you don't respond correctly to them. It's just sin. Everybody sins. And I, I'm thinking, that's where that lady is at. I mean, she, she definitely gave us a date of salvation. She seemed to understand, said, yes, actually, I, I, I have been saved. And I went through and I said, look, then I need to encourage you with this. If you're truly saved, and I said, only you and God know that. I you need you to understand that that is not something you lose. Just like the day you were born to your parents, Nothing you will ever do can ever change the fact that you bear their image, that you have their name, that you have your father's blood flowing through your veins. Nothing can ever change that reality. It cannot be changed. It's an impossibility. The day you got saved, you got the blood of Jesus Christ, in a sense, running through your veins. You now bear the image of Christ. Whether we portray it well to others is another matter, and you have his name. That cannot change. That cannot change. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of your calling, your salvation. The hope. I was getting ready this morning. I get up and I do my praying and reading first, and I come over here around 8 o'clock and I get the building ready. And for some reason, I just I had a little bit extra time, so. I started listening to Dr. David Gibbs. How many of you ever heard Dr. David Gibbs preach? Okay. Dr. Gibbs was actually here several years ago, preached for us, tremendous preacher. And his message was about hope. And he, and he went through these different attitudes of hope, a wishful hope. You're going down uh, the interstate, and the speed limit is 70, and you're doing 85. And there's a state patrol officer. And now you have hope. I hope he doesn't pull me over. I hope he doesn't pull me over. That's wishful hope. And there is the classical definition. In fact, if you look at this word, it will say expectation. When you go in for the surgery to have your gallbladder removed, well, how many people die from gallbladder surgery? Hardly anybody. But there are always exceptions, aren't there? And so you hope that you will not die. You're not really expecting to die. You're expecting to live. He said that's ex expectant hope. But then he said there's certain hopes. We have an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. And that certain hope. And, I, and I, I never thought of it in those ways. But I like that. I like what Dr. Gibbs said. We have certain hope. These are things that will happen. Why? Because God cannot lie. The book of Malachi says, he changeth not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever he has said, whatever he has promised, you and I as a Christian can have certain hope that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know the hope that certain expectation of your salvation. Now notice this at the end of verse 18. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. What, what a wonderful thought. He said, I want you to have understanding about this abundance that God has provided you. Not will provide you, has already provided you. It is a glorious inheritance. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, God hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, a living, certain expectation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now listen to this. I love this verse. To an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, 
and that fadeth not away, I love this, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven for you. That, that's already there. That's not rewards. That's not rewards for giving a cup of cold water in his name. That is not for going out soul winning. That is not, those are things that every believer, just because you're part of the family, you're going to get. There's a difference between your inheritance and your rewards. We ought to faithfully serve him so that we can cast our crowns back at his feet, the soul winner's crown, the crown of righteousness, and so forth. But every one of us who are saved, we have an inheritance await, awaiting us. And it is certain, as certain as I am standing behind this old wooden pulpit in this little auditorium in Bridgeport, West Virginia, so certain that at this very moment, my, my inheritance is waiting for me. Paul said, I pray that you'll understand this. I pray you, the light will come on for you and you realize what you have in Christ. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul said, I want you to understand just how great God's power is. It was power that saved you. It is his power that keeps you. We are kept by the what? Power of God. We're kept, secured from this moment through all eternity. It can't be changed. It can never, ever, ever be changed. What a blessing that you and I have. Those of us who are saints and faithful because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a tremendous thing. Now, I mentioned when we looked at verse 15, that conjunction, wherefore. Everything Paul was praying, now listen, was based on who the Ephesians were. And verses 1 through 14 tells us who the Ephesians were. Everything we read about the Ephesians is true about who we are. And you'll notice in this passage, verses 1 through 14, a statement that is made 10 times, 10 times within the first 13 verses, actually. And that statement is this, in Christ. Remember that you are in Christ. In verse 1, in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, in Christ. Verse 4, in him or in Christ. Verse 7, in whom or in Christ. And again in verse uh, 10, in Christ. And another time in verse 10, in him or in Christ. Verse 11, in whom or in Christ. Verse 12, in Christ. Verse 13, twice, in whom or in Christ. Ten times Paul emphasizes to the believers you are in Christ. You are in him. You're in him. If you struggled with eternal security, as we like to say, after reading this, it's like, how could you ever struggle with that? When I was on staff at Belmont Baptist, we had another staff member, and his wife had come out of a Pentecostal background. Most Pentecostal churches, in fact, I would say all of them teach you cannot maintain your salvation. You lose your salvation. Now here is this wife of an independent fundamental Baptist associate pastor who struggled with the thought of keeping her salvation. I'm glad to say after a number of years, God settled it for her. Because the truth of God's word, when he begins to enlighten you, will lead you to these truths. What a great truth that we are in Christ. Now, Paul was repetitive, and he was repetitive about this with a purpose. You are in Christ. And go back to verse 3. He says that 
God, because of Jesus Christ, hath blessed us, if you would. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, not some, not most, all spiritual blessings. Now notice this phrase, in heavenly places, in Christ. In heavenly places. Now, several years ago, I think it was on a, either a Sunday night or Wednesday night, I taught through the book of Ephesians. Most of you probably won't even remember that. A lot of you weren't here at that time. In heavenly places. That sounds like just a spiritual realm. It's just like this mystical spiritual realm, kind of like when we talk about walking in the spirit. It's like, well, that must mean that you're walking six inches off the floor and just, ooh. No. In heavenly places. Listen, heavenly places is a literal place. There are four references in the book of Ephesians that use that term, heavenly places. Look at verse 20. Chapter 1, verse 20. Which he, God, wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now listen to this. And set him at his own, own right hand in heavenly places. Acts chapter 1. Jesus leads the disciples out. And then what happens to Jesus? He ascends. And as he's ascending... Angels say to the disciples, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you will so come again. Just like you've seen him go, so he's going to come again. And we know this because the Bible is very plain. In fact, the book of Ephesians talks about this. That Christ, right here, was seated at the right hand of the Father. That was a literal ascension. The disciples are, are doing this. Why are you gazing into heaven? This is, you knew this was going to happen. He's, he's going to sit at the right hand of the Father. Literally, again, as you sit in this auditorium, Jesus sits right now at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. That is a literal position as well as a spiritual position. It is a physical realm. Jesus Christ still has a body. He has a glorified body. Remember when he rose from the dead in the book of Luke, chapter 24, he says, why are you afraid? You remember when he entered the room, he just appeared, and you're like, oh, 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 we're seeing a ghost. He said, I'm not a ghost. He said, touch me. See, a, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as ye see me have. Right now, there's a flesh and bone man sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He, on a literal throne in a literal heaven. The writer of Ephesians, Paul says that's called heavenly places. All right, now listen. Do you, how many believe that Jesus Christ right now is seated at the right hand of God in heaven in a literal form? Okay, most of you do. All right, now where are you? Ten times he says you are where? You are in Christ. So if Christ is at the right hand of the Father, literally, where are you? So I'm in an auditorium at Belmont, or not Belmont, Grace Baptist Church in Bridgeport, West Virginia. Well, you are, but in God's eyes... Tori is right now in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Jim is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Cassie is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And every one of us, who in the name, the name of Jesus Christ, who have put our faith in Christ, we are now saints, we're faithful, and we're seated at the right hand of the Father. You say, I have a hard time accepting that. Okay, good. Let's look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. Begin to read in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. What does the word quicken mean? To make alive. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Now listen. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is Jesus Christ literally at the moment, at this very moment as I stand here and as you sit here, right at this very moment, Christ is at the right hand of the Father. 
doing the work of the high priest, the great high priest, interceding for you and me. And I am in Christ, therefore, in God's eyes, the Father's eyes, Abba's eyes, I am beside him. I'm beside him. One other reference is found in chapter 3, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. We are in heavenly places because we are in Christ. Now, all that said brings me to the icing on the cake. The thing I want you to walk out of here and be blessed with. He said we're blessed with all spiritual blessings, not some, not most, all of them. And I don't think he lists everything here, but I want to point out some of the blessings that we have because we are in Christ this morning. Verse 4. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now listen. In him he has chosen us. In Christ, he has chosen us. Now, my, one of my first messages here, I, I came here July 18th, 2004. The next Sunday, or maybe the Sunday after that, in this auditorium were four retired pastors. Actually, one was not a pastor. He was a theologian. I mean, literally, he was a theologian. He studied the word of God, not just pastoring, you know, like, like university level, seminary level. And I'm up here just starting my ministry, and I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, these guys are going to do what, what we do in higher education. We have higher what? Criticism. And I'm thinking, man, what, what a terrible thing. I'm, I'm sitting here preaching. I'm a, young, I'm a young pup. I'm new to this church, and I'm, I'm preaching in front of all these scholarly, wise, older men. Well, that, that kind of unnerved me. And I say that because in theological circles, those of you who are given to study, you understand there's a great controversy over these next few words I'm going to use. Now, I'm not going to address Calvinism. I'm not going to address Reformed theology. But there is a trend even penetrating these kind of churches today. I might address this later on. However, that's not my purpose today. He says, he has chosen us before the foundation of the world. Now, before you and I put on our theological caps and get all bent out of shape and have an argument, and by the way, in this church, I've been with a group of men where we've argued over this. In fact, I remember, John, you were in that meeting. You said, Pastor, I'm not bringing my sons here. This is what we're going to do. You'd be surprised how many arguments I've had with people in this church who don't believe what this church teaches. Let's not get bent out of shape over the theological perspective. Are you hearing what he's saying? He's chosen us. No matter where you're at in Reformed theology or no Reformed theology, Calvinism or, or Arminianism, whatever it may be, he chose me. What does that mean? It means he chose me. Hmm. Mm. Yep, I want Jeff. I want him. He chose me. John 15, 16. Have you ever thought about these words? Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples. And he says this to them, John 15, 16. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. I chose you. Folks, this is my point. He wanted me. None of you know who I am. None of you, with the exception of that young lady back there, came Katie, that young man back there named Chris, and in the nursery, a woman, the love of my life, my wife. They know me pretty well. None of the rest of you do. You may think you know me, you don't. But I have a heavenly father who makes the knowledge of my son and my daughter and my wife looks as though I'm a stranger to them. He knows my thoughts. He knows my fears. He knows my failures. 
and he wanted me. He wanted me. On October 31st, 1976, he chose me. Oh, really, before that October 31st, before I was even a thought to Donald Russell Vaughn, to Jesse Lou Vaughn, before they ever knew that I was being carried in my mother's womb, God chose me. Sometimes we have, you know, we got to prove our brilliance. We just got to prove our theological prowess and try to explain everything. Good night. Let's just enjoy the reality. He chose us. Sorry. Notice verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, this is a tremendous statement to himself. There's that, I, I want you thing. I, I chose you to myself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now listen, in him, he predestinated me. Uh, here is one of those, again, words that lend itself to argument, even within, you know, churches like ours. There's debates that constantly flow. Think about what he's saying. In Christ, he predestinated us. And that should be a clue. In Christ, he predestinated us. And that really would answer a lot of these theological debates. But anyway, what does it mean to be predestinated? It means that he predetermined to give you and me all the blessings of the adoption of children. We know we're born again. That's an instantaneous thing, just like birth is, is a, a moment in time that you can point back to. The adoption of children is God saying, every right and every blessing and every privilege I give to my only begotten son, Jesus, now belongs to Titus. Now it belongs to Zach. Every single one. Everything that is given to Christ because you are in Christ is given to you. It's the adoption of children. It's the privilege of being born again to be adopted. There's a long study. You can go back to Roman culture and Jewish culture, how they adopted children, and, and some of the interesting things they did in their adoption processes that differ a little bit from what we understand today. It's very interesting. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says this, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Daddy. Abba, Father. I mean, it's that close of a relationship. I, I watch. I watch children interact with their mom and dads, and they don't address them as Mr. Walker or Mr. Sinclair. It's Daddy or it's Dad. Well, I believe we ought to be respectful to the holiness and greatness of an all-powerful God. And that's why we're to hallow his name. But he said, by the way, I want you to hallow my name because I'm worthy of it. Malachi says, I'm a great God. I'm deserving of everything you can give me. But he said, Jeff, it's okay to call me daddy. And so I do. It's the privilege of being adopted in Christ he predestinated us. And you notice the last phrase of that verse? According to the good pleasure of his will. What does that mean theologically? Here's what it means. Because he felt like it. You get that? John, you get that this morning? Vern, you get that? He felt like it. It was according to his will. You say that makes no theological sense to me. When you have God figured out, you tell me. 
So it's just according to my will, just because I wanted to. But God, there has to be reason. Have you ever said to your children, Cause I, because I said what? So, because I said so. What is your reasoning, Dad? <laughs> that's what, you may not do that. Probably go to prison for that, but that's what you'd feel like doing. I wonder how many times God listens in our seminaries and here's a professor, and I've sat under them, you know. I've sat under professors who are very knowledgeable and they want to break everything down. And by the way, they should do that. And I'm not being disrespectful to that. I guess I am in the sense that I'm a teacher at a Bible college, you know, all this kind of stuff, big deal. I'm, I'm all for those things. But sometimes we just got to say, just because he wanted to, he just felt like it. And he do, God doesn't owe me an explanation as to why he loves me. Tommy doesn't owe me an explanation. So I just, I just want to just according to my will. It's what I felt like doing. I'm just grateful that that's what he felt like doing. Because he never had to save me. He never had to forgive me. He did not have to choose me. But he felt like it. Notice verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In him, in Christ, he has made us accepted. Now I know you've heard me say this, so you know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I like it so much. The word accepted means highly favored. Just like in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, when Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. The day I got saved there in Canton, Ohio, as a 17-year-old senior in high school, God said, you were highly favored too. And I've never lost his favor. Caroline, you got baptized in these waters not too long ago. You've not been saved that terribly long, about a year or two now. The day you got saved, God said, Caroline, I highly favor you. Favors you as much as he favored Mary that bore his son. That, my friend, is an awesome thought. Amen. That is tremendous. God has made us highly favored. Notice verse 7. In whom, or in Christ, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So in Christ we have redemption and we have forgiveness. You know what the word redemption means. Ladies, you do this at the store, you want to redeem something, you know, with coupons or whatever, and you are purchasing something, you're buying it. What are we told? He said that, I think it's 1 Corinthians Maybe 2 Corinthians 7, he says that we have been bought with a price. Peter said that we have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Not silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ we've been bought, we've been redeemed. Because each of us, Pastor Vaughn and every one of us who are redeemed now, were once in bondage to Satan. And Jesus didn't stand there and say, 100, 200, 300, you know, you know. No, his price was his life. He bought us with his blood. The word redemption means to buy. The word ransom means to loose us from that bondage. Christ was our ransom price, and he bought us with his own blood. And what did he do? He forgave us. He forgave us. Remember the chorus, gone, 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 yes, my sins are gone. Remember that? Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song, buried in the deepest what? See, yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally, praise God, my sins are, and then you spell it out, what? G-O-N-E, gone. That's true. That, that song is really based on an Old Testament passage, that our sins are buried in the depths of the sea. He said, your sins and iniquities, well, I remember what? No more. I'm forgiven totally. 
forgiven totally. Why? Because I'm in him. And you'll notice it says, it's according, now listen to this, it's according to the riches of his grace. Notice verse 18. He talks about the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Chapter 2, verse 4, the riches of his mercy. Can I tell you something about God? He is stinking rich. Now, I know that's a bad term in our culture. You know, if you're rich, you're wealthy, you're scum. You know, you must be robbing people, these terrible corporations. And listen, I know there's a lot of woke corporations now, and we can have all this debate and discussion about those kind of things. But God never said it was a sin to be rich. I was, our, the, the missionary we had here last Sunday, Brian Berry, is not from the Canton Baptist Temple, but he's, he is an interim staff there since about 2017. That's my home church. I was looking up there. They have their own missions board. It's called Sent. And they listed Canton Baptist Temple, their missionary budget for every year is $700,000. $700,000 a year to support foreign missions. $700,000. And you know what they have in that church? Several millionaires. Several. And apparently still do. When I was a boy, there was a bunch of millionaires there. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of those millionaires loved Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with being rich. Nothing wrong with being stinking rich. I'm just going to tell you something. God is extremely rich but what did he do with it second corinthians 8 9 for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be rich so he says here here's what i want to give you i want to give you the riches of my grace i want to give you the the riches of this glorious inheritance that's incorruptible, undefeated, faith not away. I want to give you the riches of my mercy. I like rich people. I like poor people. And I'm glad my God is rich. But I'm glad he became poor so that I could be rich. You're looking today at a rich man. Seriously. I'm not, I'm not just saying this, Darby. I'm a rich man. But you know what? Darby's a rich man today. Nick is a rich man today. Heather's a rich woman today. You know why? Because they're in Christ. And we understand those things. Just something else I want you to notice. Notice verse 9. He says, Having made, have made known unto us the riches over the mystery of his will. Here's that term again. According. According to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. In other words, God was his own counsel. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I don't have to get together with the, uh, you know, the most outstanding leaders in ecumenicism. I don't have to, you know, get the counsel of others, no matter how prestigious they may be in religious circles. He said, this is just something I want to do. He did it himself. You notice that, verse 9, according to his good pleasure. I just want to do it. Verse 5, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 11, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. After the counsel of his own will. God said, I just want to do these things for you. Now, here's, what, here's what's happening in most churches today. I don't say this to down other churches, but in most churches, they're teaching people, you've got to strive. You've got to endure to the end to be saved. You've got to work your way to heaven. You know why? Because they don't understand the purpose of God's own counsel. But when you become enlightened, and you give yourself to preaching, and you give yourself to God's word, he begins to show you truths. It's like, wow. I... And, I'll, and I'll be honest. After 45 years of being saved, I still sometimes, it's like, I, Father, that's just, I, I, that's hard to believe that you'd really do that for me. And that's, I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm amazed. I'm still amazed at being saved. Still amazed. 
I hope you're still amazed at being saved. Now listen, this is not something we merit by our good acts. This is something provided us because of his good pleasure. No one in this auditorium and no one outside these walls will ever merit heaven because of their own works. It is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Two more things and we're done. And by the way, I'm not going to apologize for preaching long today because I'm having too much fun. Amen. Verse 11. In whom, or in Christ also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He said, you've obtained an inheritance in Christ. What does the word obtain mean? It means you gain possession of a thing. Now, if you're not careful, some would look at the word obtain as though it's, a, it's an effort thing. I had to put some effort to gain this inheritance. Oh, contraire, my friend, that's not the case. You say, how do you know that? Well, I want you to think of what we find in verses 12 through 14. Ephesians 1, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In Christ ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. In other words, you, unto the praise of his glory. Twice he uses the word trust, once he uses the word believed. How do you obtain this inheritance? You must trust Jesus Christ. You must believe in him. That's how you obtain the inheritance. He spells it out. He gives us that understanding. Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, remember, we're called to salvation, might receive the promise of, of eternal inheritance. That's how I obtained it. The day that I trusted Christ. And that's why he said in verse 15, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord, I've heard that you have trusted him, you've believed in him, and now you're saints and faithful. You are in Christ. So we've obtained an inheritance. What's all involved in that inheritance? Well, I know this. I got a, I got a brand new body awaiting me. Now, I, I know that when Paul said today, whatever he said about as good as the pastor sings, as, as good as, whatever he said, some of you are saying he's kind of an ugly man, so he must not sing very well kind of thing. However you, however you took that this morning, it was meant for both ways, and I know Paul can hear this somewhere. However you took that, one day, praise the Lord, and I mean this, I get a brand new body. Harold and I were walking down the street, it was 90 degrees out yesterday, and it was getting humid. Harold has, has issues with knees and with his feet. He's had surgeries, and I know I, I'm so impressed with him. And I'm not trying to just puff Harold up, but I'm so impressed that when we have outreach, he's here. And it takes a lot to keep him away from going out and telling people about Jesus. And it doesn't matter his aches and pains, but you know what, Harold, one day you're going to have a brand new body. I'm only 63, I'm not very old yet, but I'm old enough to know what aches and pains are now. One day I'll have no aches, I'll have no pain. I'll be able to do what Jesus does with his body. I can be here and there and anywhere I want, and I won't even have to have Jim fly me somewhere. I'll just go, I'll fly myself, <laughs> literally. I'm going to have a brand new mansion. There'll be no pain, no death, no sorrow. No graves. I'll never have to do another funeral. That's quite an inheritance. And I'm sure there's much more that we don't even realize. I have not seen or ear heard what God hath prepared for them that love him. We cannot comprehend it. He does not reveal everything. We have an inheritance. Last thing. Verse 13. In Christ, he also trusted after that he heard the word of the truth 
of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In Christ also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In Christ, listen, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. What in the world does that mean? The word sealed means to stamp for security or stamp to preserve you. These who read these letters, whether they were Gentile or converted Jew, they understood this, especially living in a Roman province. They understood that the Caesar or a king like Herod, when they had a document, they would take the scroll and roll it up, pour wax on the edge, and then take the signet of the ring. That This says dad, not like papa, like pope. At least my kids gave this to me several years ago because I'm, I'm there. Dad if you're wondering about that. They take the signet of the ring and they would seal it for security. And unless you wanted to die, nobody opened that letter. It can only be opened by the one to whom it was sent. That was the only person that could open it. Anyone else, it was a sentence of death. That was a picture, that sealing was a picture of security and God says you are sealed unto the day a redemption until the day that Jesus Christ comes back. John chapter 6, verse 27, it's talking about Jesus. Now listen to this, this is interesting. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him, Jesus, hath the Father sealed. Jesus is sealed. Jesus cannot lose whatever he is or whatever he has. Now, where am I this morning? Where am I? Come on. Where am I? I'm in Christ. So if Christ is sealed, what am I? I'm sealed. That's amazing. That's an amazing thought. You say, why are you Baptists so big on eternal security? Because God's real big on eternal security. And what a miserable life to live. And I've told you this, the, the testimony of my father. He grew up in the Nazarene church. And by the way, they preach a gospel message. They preach, at least they used to. Anyway, I don't know what they do now. Preach salvation by grace. But they said, you can lose it. So my dad almost went into insanity. I'm talking literally almost into insanity. Because every day, man, I had a wrong thought. Man, I wasn't kind to that person like I should have been. I should have done this good thing. And I, I really didn't do it because I was late for work. And every day, man, I'm losing my salvation. If I die before I get a chance to get saved again, I'm going to go to hell. What a miserable way to live. And what a lie. What a lie. And then I got to thinking about this. When, when the Caesar would take that scroll and seal it, it could only, only be opened by the one who was worthy to open it. And it got me to think about the book of Revelation. It got me thinking about Revelation chapter 5. I just want you to listen to this as we close. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. In that same sense, who sealed Jesus Christ? God the Father. Who seals you and me? God the Father. He takes us and we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And who is worthy to loose the seals? Only Jesus Christ. That's why in Romans chapter 8, he says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that justifieth. It is truly an eternal security. Why? Because Jeff Vaughn is in Christ. Because Vern Underwood is in Christ. Because Ashley Mitchell is in Christ. I don't know if this has thrilled you like it's thrilled me, but right now I'm in cloud nine. Amen. 
Glad I'm saved. You know, we clap for people when they sing. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me, healing me, predestinating me to all these riches. Praise your name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you that you saved me and washed away my sins in the blood of your son. I thank you for eternal life. May none of us ever get over what you have done what you were doing and the position you've placed us in beside your right hand. Lord, I understand it, and yet I'm sure I don't fully understand the depth. Continue to enlighten my eyes. Continue to enlighten the people of this, your church, your people, your church into the wonderful riches of Christ. We love you. Because you have first loved us. I just want you to stand with your heads bowed. Stand if you would please with your heads bowed. Here's the invitation. Maybe just come and say thank you. Maybe you've never walked down an aisle. I'm not asking you to come and necessarily repent of some sin, some hidden thing in your life. I'm just saying, why don't, why don't you just come and just say thank you. Just say thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you, Father. Maybe you want to come and join some folks. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. Are you glad you're saved? Just let them know. If you don't walk to this altar where you're at, just say thank you. Maybe there is somebody here that doesn't know Jesus. You're not in Christ. I got good news for you. He wants you. He says, whosoever cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. It's not the will of your Father that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you. If you don't know him, he will save you if you ask him to. He said, I'm not sure I fully understand that, Pastor Vaughn. Well, if, if you don't, everybody will cheer you on. Why don't you just walk right down here and we'll have somebody step aside and make sure that you have full understanding. Let's close this morning by just singing what we sang earlier. God is so good, but let's, let's make it personal to him. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to care for me. You care for me. You care for me. You care for me. You're so good to me. No matter what your burden is today, and no doubt there are people who carry a burden, maybe many burdens. Some of your burdens I know about, some I do not. But I do know this, 
despite the burdens that sometimes weigh us down, we have much to rejoice in. And I hope you'll just take some time today just to get alone with Jesus and say thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you back tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, those who are headed to the wilds, meet me right up here as we're dismissed. You're dismissed.